All right, good. Well, um, gosh, that was awesome worship. Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, well, yeah, surprise, uh, I'm not Pastor Derek. Um, he's obviously right here, alive and well, um, but uh, he's, you know, there's a, like a football roster. He's like a healthy scratch today, okay, so don't worry about him. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Carson Spate. I'm actually an elder here at Lake Springs Church, um, and so I think that qualifies me to actually uh, preach the sermon this morning. Um, but, uh, you know, some folks might look at me and be like, ah, I'm not really sure if that guy should be an elder. He, I've been told, like, I, I have a, a very youthful face uh, for my age, so it surprises some folks. But I want you to know that I've been working on my elder persona. So, like, you know, in the last year, I've grown out this, you know, nice, big, wise beard. And I know maybe some of you haven't noticed, but, like, I'm actually growing, like, a lot of gray and white whiskers here, too. So if anybody's been doubting my qualifications, just know that I'm making progress, okay? All right. So thanks for your grace. Um, But uh, kidding aside, delighted uh, to bring God's Word to you this morning. So um, if you have your Bible with you or if you want to just grab one in front of your seat, uh, we're going to jump right into God's Word in just a minute here. Um, We're in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get right into it. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing us here this morning. Thank you for your holy word. Um, It is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. Um, It is uh, living and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. And we pray that it would come to us today, that you would speak your truth to us, that we would receive it, and know just what you desire for us to hear this morning. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart uh, be holy and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. All right, so uh, Luke 7, 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that Jesus was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner." And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. And then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. And therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. It's a powerful story. Um, Now, in your Bibles, it may have a heading up there. It may say something like, a sinful woman forgiven. I think if I had to name this story, I'd call it the awkward dinner party. It's really uncomfortable and weird, right? Have any of you ever been at like a, a dinner or a, you know, a, a big gathering or party before where everything was going great and then it just kind of came to a screeching halt. Um, I remember when I was uh, growing up, I actually went on vacation with my family and my mom and my dad and my sister and we went to Beaufort, North Carolina and we had a, a great day there by the water and we were going to have a nice dinner together, big seafood dinner and we got there and we were enjoying each other's company, talking, we ordered our meals, meals come out to the table and then um, we say our blessing, and then my mom grabs the pepper shaker, and she takes one shake of her pepper, and the entire pepper falls out. All, the whole full shaker all over her food, completely ruined. And she's like, and, you know, she kind of laughed a little bit, and she looked around like, can you guys believe that that happened? And 
And my sister and I were kind of like, yeah, we actually can believe that happened because we had conspired like a minute or two before that old trick where, you know, you unloosen the pepper top to that very last notch, you know, and then when they take that shake, it all goes out. It sounded like a great idea. And then when it happened, I realized that was an absolutely horrible idea. <laughs> Why did I do that? Right. Um, and, you know, my mom, when she realized that I was the one that did it, too, it got like really uncomfortable. And it basically for that moment ruined dinner. Dad had to get, you know, more dinner and, uh, you know, that expense and all that. So it was uh, it was one of those moments where it was like it got uncomfortable pretty quick. Um, but I have forgiving parents, and they loved me, and the, the pepper shaker story became one of family lore. And, and so this story, actually, that we're reading about is all about a forgiving parent and God. So, um, and what it does for us is it raises this question. This is the question that I want us to focus on this morning. When God gives you mercy, what do you do with it? When God gives you mercy, what do you do with it? And to answer that, we're going to explore three points. One, God wants you to know his mercy. God wants you to receive his mercy. And God wants you to extend his mercy. So let's start with this. God wants us to know his mercy. So the story needs a little bit of context, okay? So verse 36, we'll start there. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. So right here, we get a picture of, we we hear the Pharisee. Pharisee is this Uh, religious elite leader of the day, uh, would have known, memorized the Bible from front to back. Um, And a Pharisee also, they didn't get along too well with Jesus, most of them. And, you know, if we're actually, it's interesting that Simon actually invites Jesus to dinner because a lot of Pharisees didn't really want to be seen with, with Jesus or having associated with him. In fact, we hear the story of Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee, who comes to Jesus in the middle of the night just so he wouldn't be seen with them to ask him his questions, right? So if we're going to give, like, Simon any credit at all in this story, it's that he actually invited Jesus to dinner. And not just that, it wouldn't have just been them two. This was like a, this was like a dinner party. This was like a big occasion for Simon to have all of his uh, Pharisee friends and everybody come and, and sit around and recline at this table together. And people from the city could actually come in to this larger house as well, and they could kind of stand around and listen into the spiritual conversation that was happening and kind of, kind of be around. Um, so that's, that's, what's, that's what's going on here at, at Simon's house. And then 37, verse 37, And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And so um, this woman, it says she's a woman of the city, a sinner, a um, sinner. A lot of us think that 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 translation just just means that she was perhaps a prostitute. Um, But regardless of of what she was, she had a bad reputation among the people there. And and people would have probably noticed that when she came in. And they would have also noticed this alabaster flask that would have been probably, you know, hanging around her neck. It wasn't something so common for everybody to be walking around with. So we'll get back to that. Um, But, uh, and so maybe for a while... Like, this woman was, was inconspic- inconspicuous, right? But then, verse 38, And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And this, we have to admit, is probably exactly where the party got really awkward and everything stopped. And all you could probably hear was the sobbing of this woman at Jesus' feet. And in the presence of Jesus, this woman, she understood her need for God's mercy. Mercy uh, is like the classic definition is, is just being basically spared of the punishment you deserve, right? Did any of you ever play that game, Mercy, where you, you extend your hands out and you, you lock fingers with somebody else? I played this a lot as a kid. And then you said go, and then you just had this like grand struggle until, until like you could just feel your, you know, your arms and your wrist about to crack. And then somebody would yell, mercy, mercy, and then they would stop, right? Remember that game? And, but the thing is, it didn't really endear you to the other person. Like, you weren't like, oh, I'm, I'm so thankful you're like my best friend now that you didn't crack my wrist in half, right? It didn't do that. That's, that's like, you know, a, a classic definition of mercy that we take, but for God, God's mercy, so much better, so much bigger. Um, and we actually have this word that we see a lot in Scripture 
Uh, it's this common word. It's, it's called hesed. And we actually went over it this, uh, this, this summer in the Psalm series. We talked about what hesed is. And, um, and we actually see it translated often. Uh, we see it a lot in the Psalms. Steadfast love, loving kindness. So it's about so much. It's mercy, but it's, it's grace. It's favor. It's an unwavering, committed love. It's the kind of love that God has for you even when you mess up. He still loves you. It doesn't change. Um, that's said. So know that when we're talking about this word mercy this morning, we're, we're thinking about it in that depth, in that context. So the word has gotten around about Jesus, and this woman knows something about this deep, loving mercy in spite of her great sin. God wants us to know his mercy. You know, the story is, as much as it's about this woman, it's also about Simon. Um, Simon knew something about mercy. I mean, he could quote entire scripture. He knew about the hesed of God. But it seems that he didn't really know it personally. Um, It says in verse 39, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So Simon, in his self-righteousness, he sees the faults of this woman. He sees the perceived faults of Jesus, but he doesn't, he doesn't see his own, right? Um, he doesn't see his own judgmentalism toward people. He doesn't see his lack of hospitality toward his, his guests, he doesn't see that he is not loving his neighbor and, and loving someone who is hurting. He doesn't see any of that. And Jesus knows, like, this is a core issue for, for many of the Pharisees, so he perceives his thoughts. And then he says this, he says in verse 40, And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors, and one owed 500 denarii and the other 50 And when they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. So Jesus tells this short parable, and we just, we just went through this series where we're talking all about the parables. And this is a, a short one, but it's, it's, it's really important. It has this amazing key truth that we're going to explore for a minute here. Um, so we just start first with the money lender, right? Anytime you have this key figure uh, in the parable, it could be a king or a master or a landowner, represents God. So that's who this money lender is. There were two people. They were both in debt. One owed like 500 denarii, a denarii was about a day's worth of wage, so that's like one to two years worth of wages. The other, uh, about 10 times less, uh, 50 denarii, maybe like a, a month or two of wages. And neither debtor can pay. They're both in trouble. When you couldn't pay a debt, you, you were in trouble. You were going gonna to pay for that. Somebody was going to have to pay for it. But the money lender cancels the debt of both. So let's put this, these characters into the parable, right? You have the woman and the Simon. That woman and Simon, they're both in debt to God. They're both in need of his mercy. Neither woman or Simon can repay their debt, but God's forgiveness is offered to them both. So what's the difference here? The difference is that one loves God more because of how much they owe, how much they know they owe. So it begs this question, like, how how do we know how indebted we are, right? How do we know... How do we know how good or, or bad we are? I think naturally, most of us, we tend to just compare ourselves to others. We kind of we look around, right? And just being honest, like when I, when I look around, I, I tend to like to think of myself as a, you know, I don't, maybe only owe God a little bit, and maybe I only need to be forgiven a little, because I'm looking around at a lot of other folks, and maybe they're, in my eyes, not doing so hot, and that's what I am comparing it to. But the truth is this, is that, I really have no idea, no idea how indebted other people are to God, how indebted I am to God. There's no way I can quantify that, right? So a comparison, comparing myself to others, is pretty useless. And I think what Jesus calls us to is introspection. I think he calls us to, apart from all other people, just contemplate our own need, contemplate our own indebtedness, right? So when Jesus asks Simon who will love God more, it's the person who believes that they actually owe the most. 
And Tim Keller says it this way, and I think it's a, it's a really great way to think about it. He says, your love for God is a response to how deeply forgiven you feel yourself to be. Your love for God is a response to how deeply forgiven you feel yourself to be. So did you, did you see that? Like, how forgiven do I think that I am? If I only think I've sinned a little bit, and I only think I'm forgiven a little bit, then it's really going to affect the way that I love God. I'm probably only going to love him so much. But if I, like, confess that I've sinned a lot, I'm forgiven a lot, I'm going to love God so much more. The point is, it's actually advantageous for you and for me to just assume. Like, we owe God, like, 500 zillion denarii, right? Like, like that, is, that is what we feel like we should owe him. That is advantageous to us when we realize how indebted we are to him. We owe him absolutely everything. And when we do that, that's where our love for him will grow. God wants us to know his mercy. And God, he also wants us to receive his mercy. And so there's a a great story. A lot of you are familiar with it. It's uh, Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. And it's, um, it's a story. And one of the reasons it's such a great story is because there's a lot of like, a lot of the gospel of, of mercy is, is embedded in this story. And there's a couple of uh, key characters. One is Jean Valjean, and the other one is Javert. Now, Jean Valjean is this, this guy who's, uh, you know, he's lived a life as a criminal, um, not, not really a good person. Um, he's freed, but then he immediately goes and he uh, steals from a priest who, takes, who, who had taken him in. And, uh, but the priest forgives him and actually like gets him off the hook with the authorities and shows him mercy. And Jean Valjean, the whole story is him just going forth and like being a changed man and sharing that love and that mercy with others. But it was also really hard to be, uh, it's hard to be an ex-con and, and have that reputation. So he changes his identity. Then you have this guy Javert. Javert is the police officer, right? So he is the law. He is the one who enacts justice and mercy. That's what he really cares about, right? And, but Javert, he, he finds out who Jean Valjean is. And he can't accept the fact, like, just in his mind, this is a convict that's still on the loose. And this is a guy that needs justice. So Javert pursues Jean Valjean, the whole story. He's, he's hunting him down and wanting to bring him back in. And there's this critical moment and Valjean knows this, uh, that Javert's been pursuing. There's this critical moment where Javert, he gets, he gets captured by a, a mob in this revolt. And he's going to be killed. And Jean Valjean swoops in and says, I'm going to take him. I'll take care of this guy. And he takes him away, and then he ends up sparing his life. And this turns Javert's world on its head. Like, he, he can't... He can't understand what happened. He's asking himself, how could a convict show mercy to him, who's the perfect example of the law? And then he, he sings this, and these, these lyrics kind of tell his story of, his, of this internal turmoil that he's going through. I'll spare you my opera voice here. Uh, who is this man? What sort of devil is he to have caught me in a trap and choose to let me go free? It was his hour at last to put a seal on my fate, wipe up the past and wash me, watch me clean up the slate. All it would take was a flick of his knife. Vengeance was his, and he gave me back my life. I'm the law, and the law is not mocked. I'll spit his pity right back in his face. There is nothing on earth that we share. It is either Valjean or Javert. And my thoughts fly apart. Can this man be believed? Shall his sins be forgiven? Shall his crimes be reprieved? And must I now begin to doubt what I never doubted all those years? My heart is stone, but still it trembles. The world I've known is lost in shadow. I'll escape now from that world. From the world of Jean Valjean, there is nowhere I can turn. There is no way to go on. And Javert in that moment jumps uh, off a bridge to his death. There are two men, two men. One was shown mercy, and he went forth from there and, and lived a life of mercy and love to others. And the other one was shown mercy, but he couldn't bear receiving it. 
It would have changed his outlook on the law. It would have changed his outlook on people. It would have changed on how he actually saw his own goodness. So God wants us to receive his mercy. You know, Javert and Valjean, they actually look something like Simon and the woman. Um, if, we, if we turn back to the story, um, we want to look at, at what did they do actually receiving the mercy that God had for them. Um, so let's start with Simon, right? Pretty simple. He refused it. Simon refused it. Um, and until he did, there would be no change in his life. Um, now, here's what the woman didn't do. We're not going to talk about what she did do, but here's what she didn't do. Um, she didn't wallow in self-pity and, she, and stay at home. She could have done that. She could have just been getting down on herself all about her sin, but she actually went to Jesus. She went straight to Jesus. Um, and when it comes to sin, I think we've all dealt with this, right, where we, we just tend to, to beat ourselves up a lot. Um, and, uh, but if we're following Christ, if we're in Christ, it says uh, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. And we have to remember that, you know, a couple of years ago, I was actually in this, this season of uh, just being down on myself and beating myself up a lot. Um, and in this, in this particular morning, I just exercised and I was doing some sit-ups and I was, I was on the ground and I, I just kind of had my head down and I was having some negative self-talk. And I was just in that moment and I, and I felt the Spirit say to me, will you have the grace for yourself today that God has for you? Well, you have the grace for yourself that God has for you. And that changed the outlook of my day and since then uh, made, made a ton of progress there. Um, God's love and mercy is not designed to beat you up. It's designed to build you up. So remember that. Um, now, what did she do? This is where we get the example of what this, of what this woman does is incredible. Um, it says in verse 40, 44, then turning toward the woman, Jesus said to Simon, said to Simon, do you see this woman? So he's pointing it out. He's like, you, you are not the example right now. Do you see this woman and what she's doing? Like, let's follow her example if you're not going to receive this mercy. Jesus says, I entered your house. Um, you gave me no water for my feet. She has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from this time that I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she's anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. What's crazy is Simon was the host of this party. But this woman was actually acting as the host. She was doing the things that he was supposed to do. And not just that. She was going beyond this custom hospitality. She was, she was going over and beyond that, and she was doing it in a way that was actually costly to her. So there's three key ways here that I think we should pay attention to to how she receives this mercy. The first, it says that she wet his feet with tears, and she wiped them with her hair. She received mercy with humility. Um, so I think we, we should probably finally talk about the feet. There's, there's a lot of feet happening in this story, and what's the purpose of all of that? So let's address it. Uh, you know, this was a walking, sandal-wearing culture. Um, it was custom for when people came into a house, like that guest was offered some water just to clean up their feet. Um, Simon didn't even offer that, like that very just basic thing. Um, the woman, she not only offered water with her own tears, but she took the form of a lowly servant. And she, she, actually, she actually washed them instead of just Jesus having to wash them herself. And not only that, but she used her hair to do it. And this is significant because, again, in this culture, uh, in public, women, they, they wore their hair up and veiled. And they would really only put their hair down in, in private in, like, you know, a moment of vulnerability. And so for her to do this, these two things, to, to wash the feet and to put her hair down in public would have been completely humiliating in front of this huge crowd of people. But she, she didn't care. Uh, for, for her, that was the moment that she was just going to lay it out there. And, and, and I think it's a good lesson for us, right? Because um, we can be open. We can be real. We can be 
we can be raw with God. Um, we can humble ourselves before him. We can lay our guard down when we're with him. We can shed tears with him. We can confess sin to him. It is so freeing to be able to do that. So to receive God's mercy with humility. The second way is she kissed his feet, and so she received mercy with worship. So to be at, to be at someone's feet, and we actually see this a lot in, in the stories of Jesus. People came and they, they sat at his feet or they, they worshiped at his feet, right? And, and to be at someone's feet or to even kiss someone's feet, that was an action that you may reserve for a king or even a deity. And so again, she was going beyond the custom of just giving the guests a kiss. She was actually worshiping Christ. Um, and she, while she was in a humble state, she was not defeated. She was not defeated. Um, she was actually just giving praise back to Christ and, and thanksgiving and love and joy. And that's an important thing to remember too. Again, not, we're not wallowing in our self-pity here. We're thankful for this moment that we have to receive the mercy of God. And then lastly, she anoints his feet with alabaster. She received mercy with complete devotion. So alabaster boxes, they were um, these things that a lot of women would actually, they, they would wear around their neck, but it was, um, it was a really prized possession. It was uh, essentially like a family heirloom, and it was passed down, and it was one of these things that um, was usually, uh, only, it could only be used once. It was usually used for a special occasion. So a lot of times, women would hold on to them for a really long time, maybe until they, they, got, they got married, for instance, would be a time to break it open. And it was really expensive, too. It was worth like a year's worth of wages. So this would have been um, very likely this woman's most prized possession, right? Um, and she broke it open. Um, and in receiving mercy, her, her sins, uh, or actually she offered her entire livelihood back to him. You know, pouring that out. She's like, there's only one for me. I'm offering my whole livelihood to you. You are, Lord Christ, the most precious thing. Um, so, and, you know, Jesus taught us this. He's like, to, you know, to gain life, we must lose our own livelihood for his sake. So in, rece in receiving mercy, she, divides, she devotes her whole life, her whole plans to him. And so this is an incredible, incredible example to us, right? Um, in this encounter of Jesus, she's given us an example of what it looks like to live the great commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. So let us take her example in how she receives mercy. And then lastly, God wants us to extend his mercy. His love and mercy doesn't stop with us. It actually, it works through us and it moves outwardly. Um, St. Augustine says it this way, what does love look like? It has the hands to help others. It has the feet to hasten the poor and the needy. It has the eyes to see misery and want. It has the ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of men. That is what love looks like. So after the people at the table, they marveled that Jesus forgave sins, he tells the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. And it's no coincidence, I think, the very next verses in Luke 8, they talk about what Jesus is doing, and, and it says he tr he's traveling from one town and village to another. He's proclaiming good news. The 12 disciples were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, and he, and he mentions the names of some of these women. And what I think happened is, is this, this woman at, in, in the story, she, she became, she was a mercy recipient, and she joined this group of mercy recipients to then be mercy for the entire world around them. Um, and I think that's a great thing for us to think about is to actually imagine a whole world filled with people who knew and received God's mercy. That's the kind of, that's the kind of thing that can really, really change the world. So um, back to our original question, back to our original question. When God gives you mercy, what do you do with it? When God gives you mercy, what do you do with it? You know, um, Jesus is, uh, he was the one reclining at the table. He was around uh, this, this table with a bunch of Pharisees and do-gooders and, and people who thought like they were, they were living up to the standard 
that God had set for them, or at least they were trying their best. But the truth is, is that Jesus, that one reclining at the table, was the only one to ever live up to the standard that God had set for humankind, right? And um, he was actually also the only person who wasn't indebted to God for anything. But for the sins of the world to be forgiven, someone, someone had to pay for that. So in love, 2,000 years ago, on a Roman cross, Jesus Christ spread out his arms and he gave his life up for all of us. And the wrath of God, the punishment was not spared on his son, even though he was the only one who didn't owe anything. You and I have the opportunity to receive that. You know, that, it's a gift. It's a gift that cost God something. It cost him everything. But it's a free gift for you and me. It's free for us to receive. Um, so if you've, never, if you've never received this gift, uh, you can. Um, you, can, you can tell God uh, very simply that you love him and you want this. Uh, you could ask me or the person you came to church with today how to do that or, or talk with Derek um, about receiving this great mercy that God has for you. And maybe some of you, maybe you've received it before, but it's been a really, really long time since you actually felt like I'm, I was, I'm really following um, the path that Jesus set out for me. And I want you to know that if that's you, uh, it's like the story of the prodigal son where, where like the father is there, uh, God on the porch waiting to see you come over the horizon and he sees you and he's going to come running after you. He's going to be so excited and love to see you that you are returning. And for those of you who are in Christ, you're, you're following him, just a couple of things. Just one, remember, know, know how much he loves you. Know the mercy that he has for you. Actually contemplate how forgiven you are. And in so doing, you'll, you'll love him more. And, and receive that. Every day, we can receive his mercy. That's uh, such a great truth. His mercies are new every morning. It's always fresh. It's always available. When we're getting down on ourselves, just go to that mercy and thankfulness and enjoy. And then from there, extend it. So there's lots of ways that we can do this as a community together. We have some, some ministries here um, that you can get involved with. Second Home Support, Blessify, uh, Carolina Care Center. These are, these are wonderful ministries to extend mercy to a hurting world. Um, but also, I'll submit this lastly, uh, mercy happens on the micro level. Um, it, just think about the, the most important closest relationships in your life or the people you see the most and start there start there you can start with your spouse for one um, what's a way that you could extend love and mercy to your spouse today even if they've done something wrong or you know whatever it may be um, you can extend mercy to them maybe it's a, a co-worker or a neighbor who you just don't get along with what's what's some little thing that you could do to surprise them with the love of God um, maybe if you're a kid, it's a kid in your, your, your school who people don't talk to or, um, or you know, say, say, say things uh, bad against. Um, that can be something, too, that you can, you can offer them a kind word or you could, you could spend a little bit of time with them. There's so many ways in our relationships that we have around us where we can be just like Jesus, the greatest mercy giver of all time to a hurting world who needs it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much um, that you are the great mercy giver. Your love for us never fails. Uh, it is steadfast. It is unwavering. It is new and it's fresh. And it is for us today, today in this moment, we can receive it. I pray that all of us would, would contemplate that and know that we can receive your love right here in this very moment. We thank you for all you've done for us. We pray these things in the great name of your son, Jesus. Amen.